I hope you're doing well. Uh, this is the last in the series of videos on handling conflict, and uh, today we're just going to talk about trust and forgiveness and reconciliation and how those three things fit together. And just to review where we've been so far, we've talked about how uh, offense is wrong in the Christian heart, that there's uh, that righteous anger is a very tricky concept to understand, that God's love for us produces a love for others so that we can love our enemies and love those who do harm to us, who even persecute us, so that we can reach out to them in kindness and love and mercy. And then we talked uh, extensively about what that looks like when we confront someone who sins. So it's possible to uh, have a heart of love for someone, and because of that heart of love, then seek them out in confrontation, whether it's someone who sinned against us or someone who we may potentially have sinned against. And then we talked about how that produces a heart of forgiveness, that we can forgive our brothers and sisters, that love covers a multitude of sins, that we, what we extend to them is forgiveness and love whether they repent or not. And we talked about how repentance brings about reconciliation, that when a brother or sister repents, what that does is it brings reconciliation with that person so that the relationship is restored to its original place so we can still continue to care for them and love them and not bring up that offense that, they've, that they had uh, uh, in the past with us, the way that they've hurt us. That brings us to the final question of then, do we trust that person completely? Do we restore them? If we restore them to a place uh, relationally with us so that we are still in the, re restored that place of emotional bond between you and the person who's hurt you, does that rem does that mean that you have to trust them 100%? In other words, like let's say you have a husband who has a problem with severe anger towards his wife and that, per and that husband comes and repents, apparently genuinely wants to change, uh, does that mean that that wife then trusts the husband to not have anger? Or, or what about issues of lust or other things where you, you have an issue where you have a person, let's say, who's struggling with pornography. They say, I've genuinely repented uh, for, for looking at these things. Does that mean that we just trust them with a carte blanche, open, open access, internet access? Or, or, or do we say, no, while that's true, that we understand your repentance and that you've been forgiven by God, we also know that there are place, there's a place for protecting you because we don't actually trust that, you, that your spiritual walk is in a place where you're going to be able to do well with those same temptations. And the answer here, obviously, I think even by the way I phrased the question, is that trust doesn't always come as part of reconciliation completely. Now, there's a moment of trust in reconciliation because the first place that trust has to start is with repentance. When a person repents, that indicates that they ought to be trusted at least in some capacity. Why? Well, because Tr that repentance requires humility, and humility is a work of the Spirit, and if that is actually happening in the heart, where they're genuinely repenting, where they're genuinely asking for forgiveness, then that ought to be a place, sort of a groundwork that we can start building trust on. But that does not mean that we offer trust carte blanche. What does it mean? It means that we begin the process of reestablishing trust. Sometimes when we talk about trust, we talk about bonsai trees. I don't know if you've ever seen a little bonsai tree. They're very small. It takes years and years to grow them. It's very, they grow very, very slowly, and then they're trimmed carefully. Trust is like that. Uh, uh, trust grows very slowly, and it takes time to grow, and it's grown by example. So the greater levels of righteousness, the greater levels of obedience as a person grows and indicates that the reconciliation and their repentance is genuine and real, what that does is it reestablishes trust with the person that has been hurt. And, and what, that's, what that's really doing is just showing that their repentance was true. Now, why is that so important? Well, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And he distinguishes between worldly repentance or worldly sorrow and genuine godly sorrow. And what he says about godly sorrow is fascinating. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. This is so important. We want to make sure that repentance is genuine with that person. How do we do that? Well, we can we can agree, we can reconcile them to ourselves, we can trust in, in one capacity, we want to believe all things, we can trust that, they're genu that their repentance is genuine, and then we just observe. And that observation will increase trust if that re repentance is genuine. If it's not genuine, what will happen? Happen. Well, eventually, that false sorrow will ultimately lead to death, Paul says. Ultimately, false sorrow will only lead to deeper levels of sin. Why? Because it's not genuine. It's not honestly coming from the heart. It's not actually the work of the Spirit. It's actually the work of the flesh to try to restore something for some ulterior motive. And so just ob observing a person is not sinful to observe a person, not necessarily to extend full trust. It is sinful, though, to 
to refuse to forgive a person or to hold on to hurts or, or to bring up past hurts with a person. So there's a distinction between reconciliation and trust. And what's interesting here, if you're the person who has repented and is seeking to regain trust, notice what Paul says in, verses, in verse 11. He says, For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. So he says this, Your true repentance, if you truly repented to another person, you're seeking to regain trust with that person, what should it do? It should make you earnest to do that. And look what he says here. He says, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. What's he saying? He's saying you're willing to do anything at that point to establish, to reestablish trust because you have genuinely repented from the heart through the power of the Spirit for the sin that you've committed. What does that mean? It means that you are willing to rebuild trust over a very slow time. You're willing to be very patient as the other person works through those issues of hurt and pain in their hearts. You're willing to take time because the reconciliation has been established, and now you're willing to take time in order to rebuild and reestablish that trust, to let that bonsai tree grow, because you are aware of the pain that that sin has caused, not only to the other person, but also to God, and your understanding of how God has forgiven you and how He loves you has now produced a heart of love for that other person where you want to regain trust with them and you're willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. So that's where trust and reconciliation are different, both from the side of the forgiver and the forgivee, the one who needs forgiveness. I hope this is helpful for you. I hope this whole series has been helpful for you. We'll be doing some more going forward.